Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our virtual Asian carp information session, which is a part of the Ontario Invasive Species Forum. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Rebecca Schroeder, and I manage our Asian Carp Canada program at the Invasive Species Centre, and I will be your moderator for this session. Um, I know we have a lot of people joining us today as a part of this, the forum, but some of you are here specifically for this information session. So I just wanted to take a quick minute to introduce the ISB. The Invasive Species Centre is a not-for-profit organization that connects stakeholders, knowledge, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. We have a ton of great resources on our website. If you're interested in checking them out, you can sign up to receive emails from us, like our newsletter, media scan, and event invites for things such as this. You can also check out our AsianCarp.ca website, which has a ton of great information on Asian carps, like species profiles, our webinar series, risk assessment summaries, and a lot more. So be sure to check that out as well if you're interested. This is just a little snapshot of how the session is gonna run. Uh, we're gonna start off with a update from Fisheries and Oceans Canada on their Asian Carp Canada program. And then we're gonna hear about some of the great research being done at the University of Toronto Scarborough. And then we're gonna get into our question and answer, answer period with our panel of experts. But before we get into everything, I, I do wanna go over a couple of logistics. Um, if you have questions at any time, please type them in the question box and we will get to them during that period. We did have some questions come through um, during registration because we asked if you wanted to send in any in advance. So we will also get to those. But um, if we do run out of time, everything's recorded and we'll follow up with you via email if we can't get to them within that allotted time at the end. Um, also, we have a, oh, actually before that. If when you're asking a question, if you don't mind specifying who you would like it to go to, which of our presenters, that would be really helpful. Um, if not, I'll do my best to direct it to the appropriate panelists. And again, we'll do our best to get to all the questions, but if we can't, just bear with us and, and we'll follow up with you after. Um, there's gonna be a survey as well after this session. So if you could fill it out, we would really appreciate your feedback so that we can learn and plan future sessions. And now um, let's get to the presentation. So first up we have, I'm gonna introduce all of our speakers before we get into everything. So this is who you'll be hearing from today. We have Jennifer Wright Cavanaugh, who is a senior biologist at Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Jennifer is an Asian Carp Program Advisor who has, led, uh, who has a lead role in outreach and partnerships. She has worked with the Asian Carp Program since the fall of 2017. And previous to that, she worked as a senior biologist with the Fisheries Protection Program at DFO, conducting project reviews of work in and around water to ensure compliance with the Fisheries Act. Nick is a professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Toronto Scarborough. He is the director of a professional master's program in conservation and biodiversity. His research lab examines the biogeography, biodiversity, and conservation of freshwater fishes. He has co-authored more than 300 scientific articles and reports and several books. Paul Bazonic is a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto Scarborough in Scarborough studying in Dr. Mandrak's conservation ecology lab. Paul studies the movement and behavior of invasive fish and frequently collaborates with Fisheries and Oceans Canada's Asian Carp Program to evaluate potential non-physical fish deterrent technologies. He uses both lab and field techniques in his research. And finally, we're joined by Eric Dean, who is a third year PhD student at the University of Toronto Scarborough, co-supervised by Nicholas Mandrak and Andrew Drake. Using a computational approach, Eric is developing mathematical models to explore how changing environmental conditions may affect the performance of Asian carp populations in the Laurentian Great Lakes. So with that, I'm gonna pass it to Jen and I'm just gonna give you um, some keyboard and mouse control. So you should have that and it is all yours, Jen. Thank you, Rebecca. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. That's great. So thank you very much for the introductions and I'd like to thank the Invasive Species Center for organizing this information session on Asian carp research. So to jump right in, um, I'd like to first uh, recognize that we may have participants today joining us from the United States. So I'd like to point out that unless otherwise noted, I'm only referring to Canadian waters of the Great Lakes and Canada's position with respect to Asian carps. So Asian carps are among the top aquatic invasive species being monitored in Canada and for their potential arrival into the Great Lakes. Fisheries and Oceans Canada takes these threats very seriously and is committed to responding quickly and effectively. So 
sorry folks, there's a lag here and might just have to click down on the screen, Jen, and then it'll, there you go. There we go. So the development of the Asian CARB program was a key outcome of the binational ecological risk assessment of big headed carps for the Great Lakes. Given the high risk of Asian carp introduction and consequences, in May 2012, an Asian carp program was announced by the Government of Canada with a goal to protect the integrity of the Great Lakes Basin by preventing the arrival, the establishment, and spread of all four Asian carp species. Since the inception of the program, our team has been working dil diligently with U.S. partners to protect the Great Lakes from these highly invasive freshwater fishes. DFO has also um, a significant and successful partnership with the province of Ontario's Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, as both of our agencies have a joint responsibility for AIS in Ontario. The program is designed to monitor and manage all four species and was built on four core pillars. Um, first, the prevention pillar, the early warning pillar, response pillar, and management pillar. For today, I have um, only 10 minutes to provide a very brief update. So I'm going to focus on the exciting work that we're doing uh, under the early warning and response pillars. And I'm just going to be scratching the surface. So really just highlighting um, these two important pillars. And also I'm gonna to touch on how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted these two aspects of the program. But if you are interested in a more fulsome update on the program overall, or um, a lot more detail on the early warning and response pillars, I myself gave a presentation uh, covering the program in October of last year, and David Marson, another senior biologist with the program who leads our early warning and response pillars and, and our field operations gave a much more detailed presentation a few weeks ago on February 4th. And both of these presentations were recorded and you can find them at asiandarpcarp.ca um, at the website and um, view them there. So to prevent introduction, the Asian CARP program implements an early detection surveillance um, program, and that's alongside um, the partners, both the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources and the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Um, and it's with the objective of finding these Asian CARPs uh, that may be present and re removing them safely. Early detection surveillance serves two goals for DFO. First, it's to target high risk sites to detect and remove Asian carps, especially grass carp, which is the species that is the most imminent or immediate threat to the Great Lakes um, right now. And two, to collect baseline fish community data so we know what the fish community should look like without Asian carp. So if they ever do arrive and establish here on the Canadian side of the Great Lakes, we can properly assess the impact of that. Surveillance activities are coordinated each year between DFO um, and the ministry in terms of location, schedule, and gear methods that we use. So searching for and finding these species that may be present in very low numbers, uh, given the sheer size of the Great Lakes, it's like trying to find a needle in a haystack. The larger map on the right shows the early detection surveillance sites that are generally sampled each year from May until November. Um, and this work began in 2013. These sites are based on modeling of tributaries that have suitable spawning conditions, and that's depicted in the smaller map shown on the left hand side of the slide. There are up to 37 locations in Lakes Ontario, Huron, Erie, what we call the Huron Erie Corridor, and Lake Superior that program crews are visiting using uh, roughly nine different traditional gear types to detect and capture Asian carps. At these sites, um, crews are electrofishing and setting nets um, in river mouths, slightly up river, near shore areas, and in large wetlands. Again, in 2020, DFO deployed crews from Burlington to 
conduct early detection uh, activities. Um, however, due to COVID-19, uh, it did uh, affect um, how um, the program um, conducted the surveillance activities this year. Um, the good news is we did get out. We are only uh, delayed slightly from um, getting out in May. We got out in the end of June instead. Um, we did still focus, as we have the past few years, on the lower Great Lakes regions of so Lake Erie and the Huron Erie Corridor, where most um, of the risk is present for grass carp. And um, the, the, the one of the differences was that we did have a reduced crew capacity. But um, it was critical that we follow public health guidelines. So on top of the regular safety protocols like PFDs and special gear for our electrofishing vessels, our staff were also equipped with gowns, masks, gloves, hand sanitizers um, to protect against COVID-19 transmission. I'm not gonna go over this slide in detail. There's a lot of uh, data here summarized. Um, since the, the program began in 2013, but I just wanted to highlight um, the role, the, the row there that's uh, in block, just to give you a sense on how few grass carp there are out there. Um, so there were no captures of grass carp in 2019 um, by our crews or anyone else out on the water, and only one grass carp was captured in 2020. Um, and that was through our early detection surveillance activities. And uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this capture in a few minutes. So preventing Asian carps from ever arriving is most ideal and it's the most cost-effective way, um, but prevention can't stop everything. So we need to be able to detect these fish early and remove them quickly before they have a chance to reproduce or a chance to establish a population. So that's why we respond. Um, and you might be thinking, what does respond uh, or response mean to DFO? So it's any immediate steps or actions taken to help reduce or eliminate the threat. And partnering is very key to this. So problems can spread jurisdictional boundaries very quickly. So it's, it's best um, to share information and techniques. So the responsibility for taking action with regard to Asian carps is a shared responsibility between DFO and the province of Ontario through the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. So any detections of a live Asian carp triggers what we call the incident command system. This is led by DFO and the ministry uh, does and will participate in response as necessary. Grass carp have been and still are stocked in US, uh, some US states. And some states require the fish be sterilized. So there is a risk of finding both uh, fertile or sterile grass carp. So once we know whether a fish can reproduce, we better understand the level of threat. So even though a sterile fish, one that can't reproduce, has an impact over its lifetime, a fertile fish poses a much bigger threat and therefore our response actions reflect that. So testing determine whether a grass carp is fertile or sterile is the first piece of information we collect when the fish is in our possession. Um, we have a response plan that has trigger levels, as noted on the decision tree on the right hand side of the, the uh, slide. So for Asian carps, it's based on fertility results, the species type, and the number captured, and also their life stages. So a coordinated response uh, to a capture may involve conducting additional surveillance efforts, or it could also include um, on the water activities um, specifically um, related to electrofishing and netting and or um, eDNA sampling. So this is the grass carp uh, that was caught in 2020 that I mentioned uh, a few slides ago. This was was caught um, by DFO crews um, conducting early detection surveillance activities. It was captured on July 2nd, which is I think day two or three, I think day three um, after we began our activities in 2020. Um, it was just over a meter in length, just over 16 kilograms in weight. And it was captured in Jordan Harbor, which is Lake Ontario. And the in incident command system was immediately implemented. 
So following confirmation that this fish was a fertile female, the ICS operations branch was activated and continued intensive targeted sampling carried on for an additional four days for a total of seven days in the Jordan Harbour area. The operation ended on July 7th and no additional grass carp were captured in this area. Um, since the program began in 2012-2013, 29 grass carp have been detected in Canadian waters. Of those 29 fish, the majority were sterile, so they weren't able to reproduce. And it's also important to note that of these 29 grass carp that have come to us, they've come from a variety of sources. So not just through our own early detection surveillance work, but they've also come from commercial fishermen, um, from anglers or citizens, and through monitoring projects run by the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority. Uh, lastly, I'd like to mention, uh, in terms of response, our program does work very closely with the US. And over the past um, few years, we have um, participated in a binational coordinated grass carp removal effort. Um, they've been, um, uh, we've been targeting the Sandusky River and the Maumee River in Ohio. And uh, they're joint exercises, but led by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources. And they've involved at least six agencies at the federal, state, and provincial levels over the last few years. And these, these uh, two tributaries of Lake Erie um, are where we, we have known grass carp populations. So due to the COVID-19 pandemic, participation, participation by DFO in 2020 did not occur due to the risks and travel restrictions. So now to move on to the focus of today's session, Asian, Asian carp research. The research informs all four pillars of the program. The main focus to date has been on research related to prevention, early warning, and preparedness for response. Uh, several research projects have been completed or are underway in study areas listed on the slide. The so research to support risk assessments. Um, first off, these projects have been done collaboratively with DFO scientists, academia, federal, provincial, state agencies, and they've been conducted on the potential survival, establishment, and spread and impacts of Asian carps in the Great Lakes. These were used to inform ecological risk assessments that have been completed for big head and silver carps, uh, in 2012, and then uh, subsequently on grass carp in 2017. The binational re ecological risk assessment for black carp um, is currently underway, and we anticipate that to be released later this year. So these risk assessments uh, help us a lot in order to prioritize species, pathways, sites, and our work within the management program. So secondly, fish movement. The Asian carp program worked in collaboration with the University of Toronto Scarborough to examine the risk of direct movement of freshwater fishes through the Welland Canal and the St. Mary's River using telemetry studies. This research aimed to assess the likelihood of Asian carp movement through the connecting channels and to identify the location and timing of monitoring and control activities for Asian carps. This um, research and information collected will help managers to identify areas where fish movement occurs, areas where movement could be best controlled, and ecological characteristics of fishes that are more likely to spread through canals. In terms of control technologies, um, so while prevention is key, I mentioned that earlier for AIS management, it is important to be prepared to deploy technologies to contain unwanted fishes like Asian carps for response control and spread prevention. So DFO partnered with the University of Toronto Scarborough to evaluate seven types of non-permanent barrier control technologies to deter fish movement using controlled and laboratory study environments. So using a combination of research results, a key question is, can we identify areas that would increase chances of eradication and corral fishes to those areas using specialized techniques? Water collections, um, there is ongoing research investigating eDNA sampling strategies for routine monitoring to detect early arrivals of AIS. The Asian Carp Program is also collaborating with the US Geological Survey to optionalize, sorry, operationalize hand-held eDNA tools for enforcement officers. 
In addition, the Asian carp program has begun water sampling for trace elements in high priority areas to build a profile spatial temporal variation in river microchemistry in Ontario. These profiles can be compared to microchemistry profiles of the ear bones, what we call the otoliths of grass carp captured in the Great Lakes to better understand where they may have come from and or where they've been spending their time. And lastly, advice uh, from the research and risk assessments um, can really help support our outreach efforts. For example, we know to focus outreach on specific groups based on where in the risk assessment process the most risk lies. So for Asian carp, we know there are potential entry points, but the risk is at establishment. So we're focused on getting as many eyes out there um, that can identify and report these species um, for their arrival so we can detect them early and to avoid their establishment. So we have been fortunate to partner with several universities such as Windsor and Guelph, but today we have the University of Toronto researchers with us. So it's my pleasure to pass the session over to Dr. Nicholas Mandrak, a professor with the University of Toronto Scarborough. But first we would like to debut one of the Asian Car Program's new outreach videos to be to be released this spring, titled Perspectives on Asian Carp Prevention in Canada, a scientist and researcher featuring Dr. Mandrak and PhD candidate Paul Bazanik. So I realize I um, went very quickly through some of these, these updates and highlights. So if uh, you do have any questions that we don't have time for later today, please don't hesitate, send me an email and I'll get you, get you some answers um, back through email. And uh, I'll pass it over to you now, Rebecca, to, uh, to uh, play the video for us. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Um, just bear with me for a second, everyone, while I pull this up. Asian carps do scare me. We have seen no other species like them in North America. If they were to get in... Everybody. Asian carps do scare me. We have seen no other species like them in North America. If they were to get into the Great Lakes, their impact would be devastating. The best way to solve the Asian carp problem is to prevent them from getting into the Great Lakes in the first place. I'm working on prevention so that we can avoid the ecological damage that we know will happen if they get in. I'm Nicholas Mandrak. I'm a professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough, and I conduct research on Asian carps. My name is Paul Bizonic, and I am a researcher at the University of Toronto who works with DFO. My lab is conducting research to prevent uh, the establishment of Asian carps in Canada. For example, we're identifying tributaries that are potentially suitable for Asian carp spawning in the Great Lakes Basin. In doing so, we can identify those areas that should be monitored by organizations like Fisheries and Oceans Canada. We are also researching methods to control Asian carp should they be found in Canada. I look at non-physical barriers that we could put up to stop fishes but still allow for boat traffic to go through. That includes technologies like intense strobe lights, acoustic pressure, carbon dioxide, and I'm trying to see if the technologies that we have thought of have any weaknesses. We have mixed results so far, and we find that some barriers are better than others to control Asian carps. For every solution we try to come up with, Asian carps seem to have some traits that can combat all of the technologies we come up with. They are a perfect adversary for us to try to handle. Asian carps are on the doorstep. The prevention methods undertaken to date have been successful, but we need to continue monitoring. We need to continue developing methods to prevent their establishment.
Okay, so I'm hoping the sound worked on that, but there's a chance that it didn't. But for the sake of time, we're just gonna keep moving along. Um, so I, I hope that everyone heard it, but if not, um, it's coming out soon. So next up, we have Dr. Nick Mandrak, and I'm gonna give you keyboard and mouse, so you can take it away. Okay, Rebecca, the one thing I don't see is the actual presentation right now. Oh yes, it would help if I shared that again. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> but, but, but I did hear the, uh, the video, so the, the audio appeared to be working. Okay, awesome. Can you see the screen now? Yep. Perfect. Okay, well, um, I think the, the video and uh, Jennifer's uh, presentation was a good setup to the discussion of the, the research that we are conducting at the University of Toronto Scarborough. And uh, I'll be talking about the next two parts in the agenda, the threat of Asian carps and really what I'll be talking about is the risk of Asian carps and how our research informs risk assessments. And then uh, I will be uh, talking about research conducted by one of uh, my graduated PhD students who unfortunately couldn't attend today, Tej Hare on his uh, tributary uh, suitability uh, and analyses. Okay, so we use risk assessment in society for more than just um, assessing the risk of invasive species. In general, risk assessment is a procedure to identify the, the likelihood of, of um, threats and vulnerabilities occurring and, um, and analyze them to ascertain the magnitude of exposures. And this is basically the textbook uh, definition of risk assessment. What, what is the probability of the risk occurring and what is the magnitude of the, the threat if it does occur? So you should be able to see uh, what this means from a, a risk assessment or from an aquatic invasive species context. It's simply a procedure to determine the probability of an ecological or economic impact occurring as the result of the establishment of an invasive species. So that's what we mean when we talk about risk assessment. And in the invasive species context, we can break down those two parts a little more. The likelihood of it occurring, that is of a, an invasive species actually being introduced, and then what's the potential magnitude of the consequence. And we can break it down into um, the probability of, it, of uh, an invasive species um, being introduced is related to the likelihood of arrival. And if it arrives, can it survive in its new environment? If it, survives can it reproduce in that new environment and uh, if it can re reproduce uh, how far will it spread from that initial site of introduction and then on the uh, magnitude of consequences side for ecological risk assessments we would look at ec ecological consequences or impacts and together um, we would derive the overall risk and we've done this for asian carp several times uh, in 2004, we did a Canada-wide risk assessment for the for four species of Asian carps. And then, as uh, Jennifer pointed out, uh, we've done binational ecological risk assessments for Asian carps in the Great Lakes um, for big head and silver carp in 2011, grass carp in 2016, and there's a black carp risk assessment currently in progress. So I do want to talk about how research informs these risk assessments, and we need to think about those, those steps in, in the risk assessment process, particularly under the, the probability of introduction. So, you know, often people think of Asian carps as being uh, from Asia and hence tropical um, and fail, may fail to rem remember that Siberia is also in Asia. And in fact, Siberia is where I first actually caught Asian carps in a lake that gets um, a layer of ice up to about a meter thick. So they're very much a temperate species. And we've done um, uh, a distribution model uh, exercise where 
you can see that wherever there's red on these um, maps, uh, those are high habitat matches to their native distribution. So you can see uh, for silver carp, much of uh, southern Canada would be suitable for it. And you can see it extends all the way up into Alaska, which is just on the other side of the Bering Strait, where, where I actually collected them in Russia. And um, risk uh, research can inform risk assessment in terms of establishment. And uh, intra, uh, Asian carps have a very interesting um, uh, reproductive biology. Basically, um, they, they live in large lakes, large systems with lots of food, but they spawn in large rivers. And their spawning runs are, uh, into large rivers are triggered by warm water temperatures, generally greater than 17 degrees Celsius, and high flows that may actually be an attractive to their spawning run. Once they get up to their spawning area, uh, they will spawn, and the fertilized eggs must remain suspended in the river flow until they hatch. That is, they can't drop out, for example, if they, if they spawned uh, you know, a kilometer upstream from the, from the mouth of a lake, the eggs would likely drop out into the lake and fall, fall to the bottom and, and not hatch. So they have to remain suspended in that river flow until they do hatch. And it takes the eggs anywhere between 24 and four to 48 hours to hatch, depending on the water temperature. And the distance that they travel while they're, while they're, they're hatching depends on both the hatching time and the water velocity, that is, how fast the, the river is flowing. Uh, basically, the, the, the eggs must hatch in, in the river and the larvae settle into productive environments such as a wetland. Um, so we, we can put this information together and, and, and basically conclude that a river has to be a minimum length, has to be long enough to allow eggs to hatch while they're still suspended. We can take this information and we can, we can turn it into a well, first of all, we can turn it into a model, but I'm going to I'm going to uh, I'm going to talk about that in the next slide. But um, some of the first uh, papers on Asian carp research said that in general we've never seen Asian carp spawn in, in rivers less than 100 kilometers uh, long or 75 kilometers long. They would have a certain distance, and so um, we simply mapped those rivers. Uh, in, uh, in the Canadian portion of the Great Lakes Basin that are unimpounded for 100 kilometers upstream from the mouth. And you can see that there is not that many of them. If you just look at the mouth portion, there's only a handful of such rivers in each one of these, these uh, Great Lakes, um, which, would be, which would mean that there's limited opportunities for Asian carps to spawn. But this is very a very rudimentary uh, analysis of identifying suitable spawning rivers. Now we can take the biology of uh, Asian carps and we can we can look at this in a little more detail. We can actually look at stream flows um, and these line this line, for example, this is a, a gauging station on the Thames River in southwestern Ontario. And this is the over the course of the year from uh, by week one, which would end around January 15th, January 30th, and so on. And you can see that the stream flow is very low in, in late winter, then it increases during the spring melt, uh, melt and runoff, and then it decreases. And then as we have rain events over the course of the summer, it will increase and decrease accordingly. And this is the average flow for those by weeks over um, eight years. And then we can also see the temperature. And remember, the temperature is important for hatching rate. And then the flow is important for how far will the eggs travel um, before they hatch. And so we can take this information and we can actually, uh, oops, sorry about that. We can actually determine what length of river is required given the temperature and flow rate for a given bi-week. Uh, and then 
The other important thing is I told you that it has the water has to be at least 17 degrees Celsius for them to start their run. So if you look at 17, it's not until here, about here that they can start their run. Uh, and then it's not really until this point here where they're actually mature enough to start laying eggs. And then we take all this information and we can determine how long the river has to be for the eggs to uh, stay in suspension until they hatch. In this case, uh, in, in this by week 13, the river would have to be about 25 kilometers long, substantially shorter than that 100 kilometers that um, we, um, we, we did our initial estimates based on, again, around 25, and it actually goes down to probably about 20 kilometers. So that means that, that um, in these cases, these fish only have to run up about 20 to 25 kilometers, lay their eggs, and then they would actually hatch in the river. And this is the base. So we did this, we took information for over 800 water gauging stations for Ontario. And we could, we, there was sufficient information to do these calculations for about 100 of those sta stations. And you can see this map, which is similar to the one that uh, uh, Jennifer showed earlier. It shows how suitable each one of these um, rivers are um, for, for Asian carp spawning. And then uh, we then simply transform this into this, this um, uh, summary that um, uh, Jennifer showed earlier, which suggests that, yeah, there are many tributaries in the, in the Canadian Great Lakes Basin that would be suitable for Asian carp spawning. Now, uh, this question of spread, like think about Lake Ontario and Lake Erie. Uh, they're connected by the Niagara River. Uh, it is possible, well, um, there's no way that fish can get in, into Lake Erie from Lake Ontario through the Niagara River, but there is a canal, the Welling Canal, that would, may allow fish to move through the system. And we are interested in finding out whether or not fish do in fact move through the system and through the locks that, that these, you know, these, um, huge craters go through. And what we did is we tagged a, um, quite a few common carp and some other species like freshwater drum with these tags that that um, put out this regular pin on a frequent uh, ping that on, on like, a, like a sonar uh, at a frequency that is unique to the fish. And then we had some of these underwater listening devices listening for those pings. And we basically concluded, yes, fish can move through the locks and through the system, but they don't like to do it. And particularly, there's a flight lock, a series of three locks where, where the ships have to go over the Niagara Escarpment. Very few fish went through that system, but they do go through them. So it is possible for fish to move between Lakes Ontario and Erie through the Welling Canal. Now, what about you know, what, what if we could prevent them from moving through the canal using uh, a control measure, uh, like one of the ones that, that, that Paul Vazonic is going to talk about in a few minutes? Um, would fish actually still be able to move from, from Lake Erie into Lake Ontario over Niagara Falls, right? And of course, for ethical reasons, we would never do that experiment. But we can actually, we actually tested this by determining whether or not there's directional gene flow between native species that are found above and below the falls. And in a nutshell, what we found was that only two of seven species exhibited some potential downstream gene flow at a rate of about one individual per generation, which basically means in general, fish do not move from above the falls to below the falls. And if we were able to prevent movement between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario through the Welling Canal, um, we would likely um, prevent the movement through the, 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 the main manner in which they could move um, between the, the two water bodies. Now, I, I mentioned that we've done these, uh, these risk assessments and I've shown you how our research has informed these risk assessments. Well, the, the, the original um, Canada-wide risk assessments concluded that the risk of Asian carps to Canada 
was high for all four species. And then our more recent risk assessments uh, pre present the data in a little, a little different manner. And what you see here on the y-axis is the probability of introduction. And on the x-axis, the, the, the magnitude of the impact. Uh, and these, this is, these two graphs represent 20 years into the future and then 50 years into the future. So basically, the way to read this as if you're in the bottom left-hand corner, this is where the risk is low, it's green. As you move to the, the upper right-hand corner, this is where you end up in high risk. And we have, the, the letters represent the different Great Lakes. So we've done the risk assessment separately for each Great Lake. And the um, ellipses around each point represent our certainty or, or uncertainty with our assessment. Uh, but the, the, what you generally see here is the risk is, is generally lower for Lake Superior than for the other lakes, but across um, between time periods, risk is moving to the higher risk uh, area here. And you see that with grass carp as well, where it's all moving to high risk except for Superior. Okay, so in general, what we're seeing is over the next 20 to 50 years, uh, the, these three uh, Asian carp species um, uh, will, will have a high risk of invading and having an impact on all of the Great Lakes, except perhaps for Superior. Okay, now, you know, I, I talked about how um, research can inf inform uh, risk assessments, but Risk assessments can also inform research and management. And, and uh, so you can see uh, the risk assessment components here, probability of introduction and magnitude of impact and within introduction, arrival, survival, establishment, uh, spread. We can map this against what we might actually do to mitigate the risk. So in terms of uh, early on in the risk uh, this process, the probability of uh, of introduction, that is the likelihood of arrival. That's where prevention would be key. Uh, if they do arrive, early detection and rapid response, and then once they become established, unfortunately, we're in the control phase. So I'm just going to quickly go through some research that we are doing uh, for these different um, uh, management uh, options, and then uh, Paul and Eric will follow up on that. So. Um, Jen's already shown this. Um, the results of our, our tributary modeling to date have been used to identify where we should be doing early detection monitoring. Um, now, the thing is, um, the, uh, those, those tributary models, even though our, that second model was better than the, the uh, first, it still only considered um, the eggs moving in a linear one-dimensional way directly down in a straight line down the river. Well, we know that rivers don't, uh, don't uh, run like that and that they, they have eddies and, and uh, they have other things that may slow down or speed up the, the, um, the movement of the egg. And we, we, we wondered if we can get more accurate predictions with more data intensive and statistically complex models. And this is where the, the PhD work of um, Dr. Hare comes into play. And we also asked the questions, would tributaries be suitable for spawning every year, which we couldn't ask with our previous model? And will climate change influence suitability for spawning? So, the first thing we did is we took our, our simpler model and we, we, we applied it with more, um, with more data for eight, great late, uh, sorry, eight uh, greater Toronto area tributaries. So we had, uh, we had um, daily data for six years uh, as opposed to uh, bi-weekly data for a long time series. And so based on our results, we found that using the existing method of just the average over the six year period, two tributaries would be suitable. However, using this data intensive method, uh, six tributaries were suitable in at least one of six years. 
So using that original um, simple model likely underestimates um, the number of suitable spawning tributaries because not all spawning, uh, not all tributaries will be suitable on average, uh, but may be suitable uh, occasionally in, in, in some years, but not others. Now, this does not address this question about uh, what's happening to the egg in the water. So the next thing that Phage did is develop um, a more data intensive and statistically complex model to account for the three-dimensional flow of eggs. And uh, those models require three-dimensional flows, uh, measurements of flows and continuous temperature modeling, which is a very data intensive requirement that we just don't have on very many streams. Uh, but we, we had the good fortune of actually collecting these data uh, from the Sandusky River during an actual grass carp spawning event, which meant that we could actually validate our model with actual results. And so uh, this is the Sandusky River. You can see it's in the western basin of Lake Erie, drains into the western basin of Lake Erie. It is uh, in Ohio. So this is the location of our more intensive study. And what uh, Thage did is he developed a model to actually look at how, how um, eggs uh, flow through the system uh, during the spawning event using the, the temperature and flow data during the spawning event. So we know that it was very likely that the, the, the species, the grass carp spawned here. We know that we caught fertilized eggs here. And, and this is, this blow up is this area right here. Those dots are eggs moving through the system. So if after our model um, runs, if um, there are eggs in this area, then that suggests that our model accurately captures um, uh, the spawning event and, and, and characterizes it. So I'm just gonna run this. I uh, may not be able to, oh, sorry. Um, I may not, it looks like it may not want to run the model. Um, so, uh, let me try it one more time and if it doesn't run, okay, I'm, nope, there it goes. There go, those are the eggs moving through the system. And you can see it's moving through the area where we caught eggs. When this model ends, if there's some eggs still in this box here, that means that this model accurately represents the spawning event. And there we have it, there are eggs here. So uh, the bottom line is, is this uh, model, this more complex model is a, probably better represents um, um, a spawning suitability and is probably a better predictor of spawning suitability. Now we applied this model to the Don River. Uh, one of those um, eight tributaries that that um, Phage had um, studied with the simpler model. So we, now we applied it to the Don River. And what we see here is if the eggs leave the system, that means they're lake in, in Lake Ontario and cannot hatch. Uh, if they stay in the system, you can see it's under different flow rates. And if they stay in the system, um, one of two things happens to them. So what we see here is that under uh, a slow flow rate, they don't get very far down the system, probably not into areas that that would allow them to hatch in, in a wetland area. When it's really fast, you see most of the eggs leave the system, so the hatching success would be very low. They would end up on the bottom of Lake Ontario. But under this intermediate flow, a lot of them are dumping into wetlands, and, and, and its hatching rates would be high. And uh, so just to conclude, the conclusions from this is, um, the minimum distance upstream required for spawning is 15 kilometers. That minimum distance required increases with increasing velocity. 
And, and the, the hatching rate is lower for big head carp uh, than it is for the other species. Uh, so we see hatching rate here on these axes and, and distance mouth required under the different flow rates. And if we want to prevent spawning in the Don River, Asian carp should basically be prevented from migrating further than 10 kilometers upstream because under any flow rate, the eggs would all leave the system um, if they were spawned at less than 10 kilometers upstream. And then one last slide before I hand it over to Paul, I believe. Um, we took the very same model, uh, model for the Sandusky and we said, well, what if the water temperatures were warmer? And uh, we're warmer uh, based on what we know, what that might be future climate change scenarios in, in 2060, 2080, and 2100. So the take home message from this is hatch, hatching times go down. That's what this is showing. Um, if we were to um, superimpose the climate change temperatures onto our model, the actual Sandusky spawning event. And for the most part, the, ha the hatching rates could, could increase by as much as 60%. So climate change um, would basically, uh, under most circumstances, increase the, the hatching success of, of um, uh, Asian carp eggs in Great Lakes tributaries and hence increase the suitability of those, uh, those, um, those uh, streams for spawning. And uh, I'm gonna hand it back to, hand it over to Paul now. And uh, Rebecca, if you can give Paul control. Yep, thanks, Nick. Um, I'm gonna take that here. Hello, everyone. So I'm gonna take us through the, uh, about the next 10 minutes talking about non-physical burials. And I'm also, I'll try to do my best to bring us back on time, but it looks with the um, slide delays, that things are just, slow down a little bit. Um, you should have control now, Paul. You might just have to click down. There you go. There we go, yeah. So we know that we have uh, established Asian kelp populations throughout the Mississippi River Basin. Uh, this is connected to the Great Lakes systems uh, through the uh, Chicago area and Shipping Canal. There is, of course, interest in separating uh, these two waterways, uh, but the U.S. Supreme Court uh, rejected that request in 2010. So now uh, we're looking for ways to prevent the continued rage expansion of these Asian carp species uh, while still allowing for the continued uh, shipments of uh, millions of tons of human goods. Because prevention is much more effective than management, um, there's a lot of interest in using non-physical deterrents uh, to prevent this continued spread. Uh, currently, there is the electric barrier at the Chicago area shipping canal uh, that's doing a great job of preventing those spread. But of course, we want to increase redundancy and just add general security uh, to these systems and prevent the movement into the Great Lakes. So there's a number of different technologies currently being looked at to do this. Uh, and these either employ uh, chemical stimuli and not just stimuli such as carbon dioxide, or they alter fish physiology, such as the electric deterrence, or they alter behavior, such as the acoustic deterrence. And I'm going to take us through a broad overview of uh, some of the work that's been going on in Canada. Of course, it's also worth noting uh, that the Canadian efforts are not being done in uh, isolation. And in fact, uh, it's actually American prevention efforts uh, that are leading the charge here. Uh, first, uh, the American research budget is a bit larger, so they're doing a lot more work. And then additionally, uh, we don't have Asian carps here in Canada, and we don't want to bring Asian carps into Canada so we can research how to keep them out. So the work that I'm going to be talking about today is largely used to augment um, the uh, burial technologies being investigated throughout the states. An example of this would be the developments of the uh, integrated uh, deterrents used at Brandon Road Lock and Dam. And so here, uh, efforts are being used to implement uh, non-structural deterrents, such as an electric barrier, water jets, complex noise, and more on at a lock and dam to prevent uh, Asian carp dispersal upstream. 
So as mentioned before, we have a bit less funding and we don't have access to live Asian cops that we want to use for field testing. Uh, so this means that we have to coordinate and augment uh, American research efforts. I'm not going to go into specific details about any one study. I'm just going to give kind of a snapshot of some of the work that's going on. I also gave a longo talk um, that you can find uh, on the website. We spent about an hour going through uh, the uh, research efforts being done in Canada, as well as more detail about the research that Dr. Mandrag just discussed for uh, Thage's heels, Thage heels spawning work. So uh, the first thing being investigated was more of a proof of concept, and here behavioral trials were conducted in the lab with the goal to determine whether aversive stimuli such as sound and light actually produced an avoidance response in fishes, how long these avoidance responses lasted, and if there was potential for these deterrents uh, to produce uh, a response in the field that we could take advantage of. In addition to just uh, behavioral stimuli, we also combined behavioral and chemical stimuli. So here we're looking at um, the experimental design of an experiment where we looked at fish behavior under ambient conditions in a choice arena. So here fishes were free to move from one chamber to the next. Then we looked at their movements when we deployed carbon dioxide in the chamber that fishes were acclimated in, seeing what concentrations would push fish into a new chamber. And then finally, we uh, placed fish between a rock and a hard place, so to speak, where we inundated the chamber that fishes were acclimated to with carbon dioxide, uh, continuously degrading the environment that the fish was experiencing. But the only fish, the only environment that fishes could travel into had uh, acoustic and stroboscopic stimuli. So by deploying this treatment, we could look at what concentrations of carbon dioxide we could use to finally uh, force fishes into a evulsive environment with the sounds and lights. And this helped get a sense of the relative uh, motivational strengths of each of these deterrents. Now of uh, more interest as we move and scale up these uh, research studies is starting deploying these in the field. So once we get into a field environment, things are much more complex. We have seasonality, we've got turbidity, we've got various components, um, and we want to make sure that things work in the field uh, before we start relying on these deterrents. So here is just a video of a uh, strobe light uh, barrier that we deployed in a canal, and then we tagged fishes, as Nick mentioned before with that Welland Canal study, uh, using acoustic telemetry, we could track the whereabouts of individuals within this canal and just get a general sense of the spatial use under control and uh, deterrent treatments. Moving on to um, another field study, um, we were also interested in determining uh, how the native community of fishes is going to respond to uh, any deterrents that we deployed. So here we integrated our deterrents within a physical fishway. So this is a fishway at Coots Paradise near Hamilton, Ontario. Fishes travel, um, fishes attempt to get into the wetland, which is behind the structure, but they are collected into nets. And then uh, the nets are, or the traps are craned up and then fishes are manually sorted either into the fishway or back into um, Hamilton Hubble. And so we could uh, take advantage of this existing structure and we deployed uh, aversive stimuli, sounds and lights, uh, and later carbon dioxide in front of some of these traps. So we could see the relative effectiveness of these traps, um, take a look at the community of fish response. So we looked, we used uh, common kelp as a target species here um, because we were working in Canadian waters and we didn't have access to Asian kelp species. Uh, and we're looking at both common kelp and native species responses. So in this study, we captured over 10,000 fishes across 16 species. And we saw uh, species specific responses. Uh, so we saw that the greatest avoidance in brown bullhead, uh, lesser avoidance in common kelp, and attraction uh, to the deterrent stimuli by gizzard shad and goldfish. And what was interesting to us was the um, phylogenetic history of these species. 
Now, uh, common and Asian kelp species belong to a superorder of fish, Osteophysi, and those fish have a sensitive hearing anatomy. So fishes within this beige box uh, can hear sounds uh, at a better level than fishes outside of this uh, gray box. And what we found was that it was only individuals that belonged to this specialized hearing guild that showed any negative responses. All other fishes were actually um, attracted to our low stimulus or low intensity uh, stimuli. And then we also found a phylogenetic signal in these responses. So species which were more closely related to each other had a similar response, uh, more similar in comparison to species that were not related to each other. So these are important findings that help augment uh, some of the other work that's being done directly on Asian kelps throughout the uh, Americas. And other findings that we found here were that our response responses were much weaker than found in other studies. So we had about a 16% avoidance response in common kelp. Now, generally, we already know that common kelps uh, have a lesser avoidance response to complex sounds than the Asian kelp species. So common kelp are already a conservative proxy. But even still, this was a uh, very muted response. And we believe the reason for this uh, was that there was a complex acoustic profile uh, moving towards the uh, fishway. So fishes trying to approach the wetland had to travel under a uh, major series highway. And one of these bridges was under uh, decon demolition. So there was a very complex acoustic profile, which was a problem for the effectiveness of the acoustic deterrence, because acoustic deterrence are most effective uh, when there's a strong spatial gradient. So fishes know where the loud, scary noises, and they stay away from it. Uh, so these findings help inform um, some potential vulnerabilities to uh, acoustic deterrence. And so here and other studies help um, develop a larger plan for how uh, non-structural deterrence should be deployed. And like we see at Brandon Lock and, Lock and Road Dam, what you want to do is use uh, integrated deterrence. So you have multiple uh, systems that are redundant and help build resiliency. And then findings like these also help just fine tune uh, some of the uh, management decisions that we can make. So for example, if uh, we are considering a deployment sites, if there's very loud um, industrial work going on nearby, if there's a short-term uh, demolition or construction, uh, we should be mindful of that when we choose our deterrent stimuli. So the work that we're doing here helps fill in the gaps um, as innovative deterrents continue to be developed. And uh, we're switching now to continuing uh, more field studies. Uh, there's a lot of work done in the lab, uh, which has helped kind of act as a proof of concept that a lot of these deterrents are effective. And now it's about getting experience, deploying these in the field and uh, operationalizing them. I've just gone through a couple studies here. Um, of course, there's a couple more that are also investigating or that have been investigating, including bubble walls, electric barriers, and then alternative sound deployment designs. And with that, I'll pass it off to uh, Eric Dean, who will speak some more on the potential effects of climate change. Thank you, Paul. I am just going to pass um, the keyboard and mouse to Eric. Okay, you should all be all set up there, Eric, and you can take it away. All right. <clears throat> so now let's talk about some of the effects of, or the potential effects of climate change. Once again, I'm Eric Dean, um, and I'll cover two things in general. Let's make sure this works. There we go. So temperature, I'm going to cover temperature, specifically how it affects development and how that will ultimately affect the population growth rate, how populations can ultimately grow larger in number as a result. And generally, how this can affect uh, survival, establishment, spread, and impact. And I'll also discuss precipitation, specifically how changes in heavy rainfall patterns can affect reproduction, and then generally, how this will affect the invasion process from arrival to impact. So to start, climate change can have uh, effects upon temperature patterns in a few different ways. We could see increasing variation in temperature, which would mean that the old, uh, old climate would be this, this curve here. 
and we'd see a squish down into this new climate where you would get more extremes at either end. You would get hotter weather and, and record hot weather as well as cold weather and record cold weather. So changes on, on either end. But we could also see a change in the mean, like a mean increase in, in uh, climate. So as this distribution of, of climate goes and, and shifts to the right, we're going to see hotter days on average, which means that we're going to get more hot days, even more extreme hot days, and fewer cold days. But climate change is probably going to be presenting us a combination of both of these, an increase in both mean and variation. And so what that will result in is even more record hot weather and hot weather. However, there'll still be some cold weather, just less of it. And so how does this affect um, Asian carps in this sense? So it's worth noting that depending on the temperature, chemical reactions can happen at different rates. The warmer it is, the faster they go. And the metabolism, which is the basis for critical processes like growth and sexual maturation, it, that's the sum of all life-sustaining chemical reactions in an organism. So you could say then that the metabolism is the speed of living. So for mammals like us, we're homeotherms. We keep our body temperature fairly constant. Our speed of living, therefore, is also fairly constant. But for poikilotherms, animals whose body temperatures are controlled by the environment, like fish, their metabolisms will gear up under warmer conditions. So it follows then that if metabolism is the speed of life. Fish are, in essence, living more of their lives on a hot day than on a cold day. Warmer conditions bring about faster growth, which can lead to achieving larger body sizes. And a larger body size can mean greater rates of survival. But another important angle is that a faster metabolism also speeds up development. And sexual maturity can be reached earlier in life. But this, in turn, leads to a smaller adult size because growth starts to taper off after maturation. And smaller adults are less fecund, meaning they don't produce as many eggs as large fish do. So there are a potential number of trade-offs here, but I would like to focus on how Asian carbs can mature at a faster rate under a warming climate specifically. So big head carp, for example, occur in various locations around the world. And records indicate that they mature at different ages across environments. Generally, they tend to mature at a younger age and these lower equatorial latitudes compared to higher, colder environments. And looking at this trend of maturation across latitude can be helpful because as climate change progresses, we're going to see warming on average. And the effect of this could be like a change of climate similar uh, to um, the climate further south in latitude. So northern areas in the future are going to have conditions similar to what you see in southern areas today. So if we take these records across latitude here and we standardize them, looking at the annual air temperature for these areas, but subtracting the winter months, this relationship looks even clearer. Warmer air temperatures coincide with earlier maturity. Now, what is the impact of that? Well, reducing the number of years before reaching the age of reproduction shortens the generation time for these fish. Oh, what's that? There we go. Sorry about that. Um, shortens the generation time for these fish. And the shorter the generation time, oh, twice. Well, the shorter the generation time, the faster the population can grow, the, the faster the rate of, of population growth. So some of my research involving uh, involves simulating populations of big head carp, looking at the balance of how, how fast juveniles grow, this, the rate at which they grow, the timing of maturity, and then how large adults can get under those circumstances and how many eggs they produce, and seeing how all of this together affects their performance at the population level. And what this tells us then is the kind of population growth we can expect and prepare for in the future as areas continue to warm up over time. And through comparing populations that mature at different ages, out of ages two to six, maturation at age three results in the fastest population growth. It may be the sweet spot between the trade-offs in growth rate, adult size, and, and reproduction. Incidentally, maturation at age three is what we're observing in the Mississippi River 
uh, where these where big head carp are are extremely abundant. And we can expect similar conditions on our side of the border in the future. So taking a look at the distribution of big head carp today in the United States, the darker dots here are where species observations are greater in number. We can see that in the regions where they're highly abundant, under our current emissions behavior of high, high emissions, within the next 60 years, we can expect the Great Lakes Basin to have a, a climate similar to that region. So these hotter temperatures may mean that in the future, we'll see a um, risky rate of population growth on our side of the border, as we've seen in some troublesome areas south of the border. But these anticipated hotter temperatures also have an effect on precipitation. Warmer air can hold exponentially more moisture than cold air, which can affect how often it rains and how much it does in a given storm. So this has an impact on Asian carp because of how they spawn, as discussed. In Asia, they've been observed to spawn April to June in fast flowing water. And one of those important cues for spawning is a rise in water level. So increased rainfall could then give them the conditions necessary to reproduce. This here is a map of percent change of precipitation in Canada compared to the historical period of 1948 to 2012. The darker the green, the greater the change in precipitation. And generally in Canada, what's expected under climate change is that we will see a uh, greater amount of precipitation overall, but less summer precipitation in the southern part of Canada where it's warmer. And again, because warm air holds more moisture, conditions can remain humid for longer before rainfall is triggered. However, the effects of climate change can be very regional. Northern latitudes are warming faster than anywhere else. Um, in fact, Canada is warming at two times the global rate. And this is due to a process called polar amplification that results from uh, positive feedbacks caused by the retreat of ice and snow. The rate of warming is just building upon itself in these higher latitudes. And as the polar latitudes warm, the temperature gradient between them and the equator is reduced. But this temperature contrast is crucial. It's what powers the jet stream. And so the jet stream, as, as um, so the jet stream is a, a strong current of air that moves weather systems across the continent from west to east. And as the temperature contrast declines, this jet stream starts to weaken, resulting in more waviness. The peaks of the jet streams will be going higher. The valleys will go lower on the continent. And with that comes more extreme weather. But there's another problem here. The weaker the jet stream, the slower it moves. And what ends up happening is you could result in a blocking pot pattern in weather where the jet stream, the, the peaks and valleys will remain fixed over certain locations for extended periods of time. And so these higher pressure systems, which bring warm, dry air, um, and low pressure systems, which bring colder, moist air, can get locked in place, remaining over regions for extended periods of time. And so this, uh, at least for the high pressure systems, this is what's responsible for those extended droughts and subsequent wildfires in California, for example. But what this means for the Great Lakes Basin area is an increase in record rainfall and unprecedented flooding in the areas around the Great Lakes when we have this kind of blocking system in, in the polar jet stream. So overall, under anticipated climate change, temperatures increases could speed up the metabolism and development in Asian carps, which could in turn decrease the age of maturity. And the result of this is the potential for populations of Asian carps to grow faster in certain regions. As for precipitation, while less overall precipitation is expected under warmer conditions, there will be more extreme precipitation events causing flooding. And this type of precipitation specifically may provide more opportunity for spawning and reproduction. In Canada then, warmer temperatures are expected in the southern end of the Great Lakes Basin. And this means that the environmental conditions in the Great Lakes could support faster development, reaching sexual maturity earlier in life, leading to faster population growth. But generally, increased, uh, increased temperatures can also mean more growth early in life before maturity, which could increase early life survival. Fast population growth can then help populations establish even from low starting numbers in some situations. And of course, larger populations have a greater potential to spread. And especially as conditions get warmer and, and become more suitable further north, perhaps 
um, this will further exacerbate the impact. Lastly, due to disturbances to the jet stream, we can also expect extended periods of rainfall and sudden high magnitude precipitation events. And this could bring more reproductive opportunities as high flows and rising water levels become more frequent. With the increasing frequency and severity of floods, there could be more opportunities for Asian carp south of the border to overtop barriers and advance northward. That could impact arrival. Increased precipitation could wash greater amounts of agricultural fertilizer into the Great Lakes as well. And that could create more food, uh, prompting more growth in algae, for example. And with resources increasing for the Asian carps, the rates of survival could be improved. Of course, successful reproduction events are necessary for the population to establish and grow in number. With increased precipitation, as discussed, this can be impacted, which should in turn affect the spread and, and impact as well. And just to wrap it up, uh, I'll be quick for sake of time. There's a couple of things that I'm looking into exploring next, a couple of next steps in research. One would be to look at how, specifically at how warmer winters may affect their population performance and how the rate of warming at different times of year could affect maturation and spawning. Perhaps more warming earlier on could lead to reproduction earlier in the year. And when we're talking about these major precipitation events, knowing when they occur and whether they coincide with the suitable spawning areas and the time in which spawning is possible is another factor that I'd like to explore. Um, impacts of timing in terms of the season and year, as discussed, summer precipitation is expected to be lower overall. But if we're going to have these major precipitation events at the right time, although this is hard to predict with climate models, they, there could be particular impacts that we could identify that would be very valuable for risk assessment. And with that, I'd just like to thank everyone for listening. Thank you, Eric. Um, so now we're going to get into our question and answer period. So um, I'm going to get our presenters to get ready for that. Um, so we did have some questions that came through in registration that I will start with. Um, so the first one's going to go to Nick. Have there been any genetic influence studies to see if carp can be made less successful physically or reproductively? Um, thank you for the question. Uh, not that I'm aware of, but there has been discussion about things such as gene drives, and you may, have, some of you may have heard of this, is where you you um, it, it insert a gene into a population that is deleterious to its continued survival. And it's almost like a time bomb that eventually goes off and and um, and uh, decimates the population. Uh, I, we're very early in understanding how those work, uh, so I, I would not think of them as the silver bullet just yet, and uh, it would be premature to attempt to do this. Um, and uh, so at this point, I think there's only been discussions about potential genetic manipulations to control uh, carp, Asian carp populations. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Jen. Um, this person was wondering, what is the difference from the slide that showed only three grass carp detected since 2012 and 29 captured since 2012? So that's a great question. Uh, thanks for picking up on that. So uh, the three grass carp captured that was shown in that very large table that was the summary of our early detection surveillance works, that represents the three grass carp caught by our DFO crews uh, during um, those activities. The difference being um, the 29 represents all grass carp caught in the Canadian waters of the Great Lakes that um, are not just caught by the DFO crews out there from May to November looking for them, but also grass carp caught by the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority monitoring efforts, uh, commercial fishermen that are out um, on the water and sometimes have these stray uh, grass carp, you know, swim and get caught in their nets. And also we've had um, some that have been found dead, you know, um, on the shoreline of the Great Lakes and also caught by wreck fishers and anglers that um, they've known, you know, well enough to that they're grass carp and they've hung on to them, not thrown them back in the water. So we've collected them. So that's the 
the, the full source of where those 29 grass carp have, have come from. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is for Nick. I heard around 400 grass carp need to be removed per year to fend off establishment. Can you elaborate on how that is derived? Uh, in general, but not specifics, because uh, that was um, based on models developed by, by uh, researchers at Michigan State University. But it's, it's based on the, the same premise as um, the COVID modeling. Uh, so you may have heard of the term R naught. You may be familiar familiar with it now. It's it's the it's the rate of infection. So for example, the R naught is three. That means that three people are infected get infected from someone who is infected. And this is more or less the same that we same um, information that we use uh, in in determining population uh, growth in in things such as Asian carps. So if the R naught is above one, that means the population is getting bigger. If the R naught R naught is lower than one, then it's getting smaller. So this study um, in that Michigan State University had done concluded that given their assumptions of what the current population size is, you would have to remove this certain number, uh, for example, 400, in order for that R naught to be below one. You want that R naught to be below one because that means that the population is getting smaller. So it's based on population modeling that's entirely analogous to the COVID modeling. And it's uh, the idea is that you want to reduce the, uh, the population growth size uh, below R naught of one. So that as a result, you are actually decreasing the population size. Bottom line is, uh, I think there's, you know, it's based on an assumption of how many we think there's out there right now, which is hard to predict. I would simply say we should be going out actively uh, fishing for grass carp and removing everyone that we catch, uh, with 400 being um, a minimum target. Thank you. The next question is for Jen. Um, it was from your presentation. They were just asking about the photos of the fish. I assume these are photos of dead fish. How exactly are they killed? Is there some sort of device used? So that's a good question. I'm, I, uh, I have to admit, I haven't been out on the boats and participated in the surveillance efforts, but, um, um, I believe that we use clove oil to um, to uh, to um, I guess ethically um, have the have the fish die um, is the best way to explain it. So we're we're not hitting them over the head with fish or hitting them over the head with a hammer or anything like that. We're using clove oil so that they they die quite peacefully and quickly. They're not suffering. I, I should point out that clove oil is a recognized a method for euthanasia by the, the animal, the Canadian Council on Animal Care. Um, so I, I do know that the, the crews follow, um, strictly follow their, their, their guidelines. Yeah. Thanks, Nick, for adding that. <clears throat> okay, the next question is, um, I guess it could go to Nick, Eric, or Paul, um, whoever would like to take it. Um, this person is just looking for a quick overview on habitat and identification information, um, juvenile and adult Asian carbs versus native and naturalized non-native species. And before I pass it to you guys, there's really good resources on our website, asiancarp.ca. About that, we have a whole um, confused carp section on Ontario species that can be commonly confused with Asian carps as well as um, bait fish species. So that's a good resource for that. But um, if any of you guys want to give a little quick overview of maybe the key ID features. Well, I, I, I was going to suggest that maybe Paul or Eric could uh, go over the, the habitat uh, question as it relates to other species, and uh, because of it, you know, it might be a it might be a question on their their PhD defense. Interesting. Okay. Throwing <laughs> us under the bus a little bit there, Nick. Um, but yeah, so that habitat is going to defend uh, depend slightly on 
which Asian cub species we'll, we're talking about, and then also uh, the time of year and the activity. Um, but generally, when they're looking to spawn, uh, the, the cub species move upstream into uh, warmer water productive uh, systems. And so for, for my work, looking at um, uh, how we can prevent that upstream movement, um, I'm largely interested in uh, preventing uh, dispersal into uh, wetlands type environments. And I suppose it's worth mentioning just some of the basics here in terms of their diets. So grass carp, of course, are, are looking to consume plant matter, macrophytes, while the silver and, and bakehead carp are uh, planktivorous, uh, phytoplankton and, and zooplankton, while we have black carp, which preys on, on mussels and, and snails. So, of course, that will impact the kind of habitat they're living in. But one thing I'd like to add on here from my particular discipline here is in terms of temperatures. Um, people often, I think, ask about the temperature ranges they can live in. And to be brief about it, there's a, a very wide range of temperatures that they are exhibited to um, have, uh, live within in, in the world. So they're, they have quite a large range of tolerance. Thank you. Um, that was actually the next question was, is there a cold weather tolerance? And I was going to direct that one to you, but I think you answered it there. So that's great. Um, well, the well, next I'll question. I'll add a couple things. If, yeah, sure. Sorry. If, there's, if there's a question specifically about cold weather tolerance, cold weather tolerance, yeah. I'll just bring up a couple things here. So, I mean, Dr. Mandrick mentioned earlier that his first experience with Asian carps catching Asian carp was in Siberia, where um, was it a, a whole meter of ice with places that are cold enough for that? So as mentioned, they, they have an extremely, well, uh, quite a wide uh, temperature tolerance. Uh, black carp, for example, living in the Amur River Basin in Northeast Asia, that's between China and Russia. This part of the world drops below negative 27 in the winter. Um, but they also spawn at temperatures at 30 degrees Celsius in China and the Yangtze River. Um, so there's this huge range here. I think Another thing worth mentioning too, because when we're thinking about them coming into Canada, perhaps the, the cold weather ones are the most impact, impactful. Bakehead carp, they're present in the Manchurian Plain. So that's at the same latitude as Mongolia and, and Sapporo, Japan. And that place is frozen four to six months out of the year and, and they persist there. So they have a, a definitely quite a tolerance for cold temperatures. I'll just uh, follow up uh, briefly on that. Our, our American colleague, Dwayne Chapman, watches big head carp starve to being almost skeletal in winter. And then as soon as spring comes and there's more food in the water, all of a sudden they, they plump back up again. They, uh, they appear to have a, an amazing ability to, pers to persist in cold waters. Okay, great. The next question is for Nick. I am struck by how opposite the spawning stream habitat requirements are for Asian carp versus salmon. Has anybody considered doing salmon habitat restoration work on Asian carp spawning streams to reduce water temperatures and create flow disruptions with woody structure um, so that it need not be full river interruption for splash pools? Uh, excellent question. And it's almost the question for Paul about what could we do to, to interrupt their, their life cycle or, or prevent them from moving. Because we've been thinking about these spawning tributaries more pro along the lines of can we prevent them from moving. Um, other thoughts we've had is, you know, if, if there's a dam on the system, can we alter the flow in the dam? Uh, like, for example, in the Trent Severn system, uh, in the Trent River is, is likely suitable. Uh, can we modify the flow through the dams to, to make it not suitable um, for Asian carps? Uh, I, I, those are excellent. That's an excellent idea. And, and we haven't taken it to the, the point yet where we've said, can, can we, can we, can we um, retrofit a system to maximize benefit for native species and minimize benefit, say, for Asian carps? But, uh, th that is an excellent idea and would be a very interesting project to, to do in the future. Yeah, maybe I just wanted to add a bit to that. So in terms of the specific uh, Asian carp salmonid uh, connection, no, I, I don't think there's been much discussion about that. But there is definitely a broader discussion about how to best optimize tributaries um, for both native and invasive species. An example of this ongoing discussion is also included for uh, sea lamprey. So uh, there's a lot of small uh, 
dams that block tributaries, uh, which can be problematic for native species, uh, but helps with uh, sea lamprey disposal, which like um, the Asian kelp species travel upstream to spawn. And so there's emerging research, not just for uh, preventing Asian kelp disposal at critical regions like the uh, Chicago area shipping canal, but then other uh, smaller tributaries uh, where work could be done to deploy, say, a seasonal electric barrier or the use of noxious stimuli to help reduce the propagule pressure of those individuals within small tributaries. Because physical dams, um, a lot of the physical dams that we've built now are starting to age out. And then there's questions on, do we want to really make a new physical dam? Um, the pros and cons, uh, there's some possible advantages to using a uh, smaller uh, non-structural deterrent in that case. Great. The next question is for Jen. Um, at the monitoring sites for carp, you mentioned, why would you capture an infertile carp? Is that a reflection of the origin of the fish? Yes, so as I mentioned that uh, some U.S. states still allow for um, grass carp to be stocked in ponds, um, but um, th they are um, sterilized, so they're not capable of reproducing. So if those carp um, escape from those areas in the U.S., they can make their ways into Canadian waters. So the grass carp that we're finding you know, of those 29 uh, to date, um, they can be either sterile, um, so not capable of reproducing or fertile. So um, we've just been fortunate to date that most of those 29 have been sterile grass carp and not capable of, of reproducing. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, Jen. Um, the next question is for Paul. They're hoping that you can elaborate on the U.S. Supreme Court decision. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm a biologist in Canada, so my, my, uh, my knowledge on U.S. law is a little bit limited, um, but kind of a broad overview being back in 2010, uh, they made a request to the Supreme Court, um, a preliminary injunction about closing the uh, Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal. So this is that major connection that connects the upper Mississippi uh, river system with the Laurentian Great Lakes. Uh, but this is an important canal. I was first developed uh, for, for sanitation for Chicago and now is a uh, central and key component of uh, materials transport. Um, and it was decided at the uh, preliminary uh, injunction that the, the, the cost to uh, the, the, the economic system that depends on the movement of these goods would be too great and so uh, they're not gonna hydrologically separate these waters. And so that's then developed uh, this uh, continued interest in alternative non-structural uh, deterrent technologies. Perfect, thank you. Uh, the next question is for Eric. Regarding the potential increase in Asian carps over time with climate change, do we not also need to know what the impact will be on other fish species to assess if the increase will be significant? Absolutely. Um, I, I think that's definitely something that will be necessary to assess how this impact is changing. Um, of course, another reason for this is that we want to not just measure how Asian carp populations are maybe performing better or worse given the conditions, but then in turn, how those other species are impacted by Asian carps. Um, there's been some, some research that I'm aware of looking at those interactions. Um, Asian carps they, 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 the juveniles or, or, or young of year may even be um, an alternate food source for some um, fishes, native species in the Great Lakes, as I understand, smallmouth bass, for example. But to answer that question, yes, and that's something I hope to look into further, is to measure how climate change is perhaps shifting the dominance in our native ecosystems between our current native species and potential Asian carp invaders. Yeah, I can follow up on that too. So, like, if you think back to the the graph that I showed about the that that represented the results of our risk assessments, and we had 2020 and we had 2050, that was based on current climate and how we we expected the population to increase and spread over time. 
just think of it this way. We're going to get to that upper right hand corner of the graph quicker uh, under climate change because the population size is going to grow quicker. And which means that, you know, the, the impacts are really directly related to the, the, the population size. And, and this is ex particularly true for grass carp because we know that grass carp have been deliberately introduced into places like um, ponds to control uh, aquatic vegetation. And we actually know what densities you should stock ponds um, based on how much vegetation you want to control. So basically, there's a direct relationship between vegetation loss and uh, the, the population size, right? So uh, with grass carp, it, the population size grows quicker. It means that the densities are going to increase quicker and there's going to be uh, a greater impact uh, in a shorter period of time on aquatic vegetation which then ends up resulting in impacts on all the other elements of the ecosystem that interact with aquatic vegetation. Great. The next question um, is for Jen. Are there any suggestions that you can offer to the average person to help with this situation. That's a great question, and thank you to the person who answered that. Um, so I would say all of us, all of us here in Canada, have a role to play in um, protecting Canadian waters from these these harmful species. So if you're out um, and enjoy the water. Uh, whether you're on or around it, learn how to identify the four species. And the asiancarp.ca is a great uh, resource to go to to learn how to identify um, these four species and learn how to uh, report them. So th there's multiple ways in which you can report them. You can report them to the invading species hotline. You can re report them through an, um, the early detection distribution system mapping app. Um, or email, um, or you can simply email the Invading Species um, Awareness Program and report them, and they'll verify whether you've you've actually caught an Asian carp species, and if so, they get that information to DFO uh, right away. So um, there's also a brand new uh, fact sheet on how to identify grass carp, since it is the most immediate threat that we have right now, and that can be found at multiple locations, including asiancarp.ca, and um, the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters um, Awareness Program has, has the fact sheet available there. So if you go through that fact sheet and you can't reach the hotline, um, it tells you what to do with that fish. So um, if you're fairly confident you do have a grass carp, we ask that you not release it back into the water and that you hang on to that fish and um, keep it in a cooler head above the ice. Um, we use the, the fluids from the eyeball to run um, analyses on that fish. The most important piece is determining whether that fish is a fertile or sterile fish. Um, and then we will come and pick up that fish from you. So um, um, yeah, that's, that's how anybody in Canada can help, um, help us out right now. Thanks for the question. I would Thanks, also maybe, uh, just add a little bit to that, that, um, um, you know the capacity of of these binational efforts to to maintain uh, these Asian cub species depends uh, at least in part on funding, and then funding uh, is dependent at least on part by public pressure. So by you know continuing to attend talks like this, by being engaged, uh, talking amongst uh, your friends on on fishing trips and so on with family, that that engagement uh, uh, does matter. Uh, uh, government uh, is interested in learning what what issues that the people are concerned about, and that can then uh, help drive continued uh, funding for continued efforts. Awesome. Um, the next question is, how do Asian carps interact with invasive aquatic vegetation? Things like your Asian water milfoil, frog bit, frog my knees. Um, I don't know if Nick, Paul, or Eric wants to take that one. Uh, I can, I can um, take a stab at it. Well, let, uh, the uh, the short answer is they're not going to control them, right? So if we think that grass carp is the solution 
to an invasive um, aquatic vegetation. It's not the case. They, in fact, they have a very, they are sort of picky eaters. Uh, and uh, so even though we saw that in the, the video, we saw the grass carp nipping at the, the leaf blade to um, a reed, it would not eat the stalk. And so I think Pragmites is ruled out. Uh, some of the invasive aquatic plants actually have silica in their, um, embedded in their tissues, uh, probably as an anti-herbivory um, uh, um, uh, strategy. Uh, you know, silica is basically glass. Asian carps, do, uh, grass carps do not like that. Uh, so, uh, I think what will what would likely happen is you have the negative impact of of both the invasive plant and the invasive grass carp on native vegetation. So unfortunately, I don't think that um, we can expect a, a grass carp to be the solution to our invasive vegetation uh, issue. Interestingly, a colleague of mine did a study, an inadvertent study on the effect of grass carp on aquatic vegetation in South Africa. Uh, he was working on the veget aquatic vegetation of an, a, a pristine area in South Africa. Grass carp was introduced. Within two years, 15 of the 16 aquatic species that were the basis for his study, the aquatic vegetation species, were gone. Um, they have a catastrophic effect on vegetation. Uh, bottom line, and they are not our solution. They will, will not be the solution to invasive aquatic plants. If if I could also just add on to that a little bit, um, I want to speak more broadly. Uh, those are general trends um, that systems, as they get degraded by biological invasions, then become more susceptible to further biological invasions. Um, and so, as the Great Lakes are being uh, attacked by these invasive plant species, invasive invertebrates and fishes. Uh, in aggregate, all of these continued uh, biological invasions erode a bit more of the Laurentian Great Lakes uh, resilience to further invasive species. Um, so uh, what we're doing here is important um, to protect the Great Lakes against uh, Asian carps, but then also uh, preventing the continued um, uh, meltdown that you can see when uh, system kind of passes a threshold of uh, ecosystem degradation. And so that's just another mind thing to be mindful of. And I would suggest keep that in mind when uh, if you attend the Tench um, uh, talk uh, coming up. Great. Um, I want to be a little mindful of time. We, we do have quite a few more questions. I don't know that we'll get to all of them, but I think we have time for one or two more. Um, the next question is to, I think, Jen and then potentially Nick as well. Are grass carp now considered to be established in Lake Erie given documented reproduction in Ohio tributaries? I believe that the binational risk assessment for grass carp previously noted that they were not yet established. Well, um... I, I, I could um, answer first. Uh, in, in, in my mind, and I, I think the definition that we used in that binational risk assessment was that establishment would be when we had uh, um, grass carp that were spawned in the Great Lakes now reproducing, right? So we know that grass carp are reproducing in the Great in, in Lake Erie, uh, specifically the Sandusky and, and Maumee Rivers. Whether or not there's that second generation that's actually reproducing, I, I think um, we're probably close to knowing that, uh, just because of the the generation time, the, the, the lag between you know the first uh, reproduction and the development of the um, those spawn in the Great Lakes into mature adults, then then will spawn themselves. Uh, so they're definitely reproducing. Uh, I, I don't know if there's firm evidence yet of establishment. I have nothing to add to that. That covered it well. Um, okay, the next question is, 
Can Asian carp eggs be transported in boats, biles, or engines? Well, I would, I would basically say, no, based on what, what we've just talked about over the last hour regarding uh, the biology of the species, uh, those, th those eggs were fertilized, they would be very unlikely to hatch and, and survive. Um, uh, that doesn't mean that we should not making, be making sure that our, our, our boats and villages are, are free of all invasive species. If there are Asian carp eggs in those areas, it means that you have not done a good job of, of making sure that your boat is clean and free of invasive species in general. Okay, um, the next question is, is there interest in using YY technology in future or currently in the US as a future eradication technology? Would there be reasons why this technology, if proven in trout species would work or not work in Asian carp species? Sorry, you said YY technology as in um, all male? Yeah. And, and I guess that's related to the first, uh, the first question about genetic influence, and and there has been discussion, um, but uh, uh, um, I would uh, sorry I, I just not up on those discussions, but I know that people have discussed it, and I, I'm not sure what the potential impediments are um, to actually doing that. Okay, uh, the next question is for Paul. What is the impact of barrier strategies to other species? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, and that's going to depend on uh, the barrier that we're talking about as well and the kind of the goal of that site deployment. So when we talk about the electric barrier at the Chicago Shipping Canal or the uh, multi deterrence uh, integrated uh, barrier that's being proposed for Brandon Lock and Dam. You're probably going to see uh, the movement of all fish species uh, stop throughout those systems because we're trying to target multiple, multiple sensory modalities and we're really aiming to produce a um, strong avoidance response in our target species, the Asian cub species. But as a consequence, that's likely going to have uh, strong avoidance responses in the non target species as well. So, uh, an important consideration for site deployments is uh, what all the what does the movement of native species look like through those systems for the chicago area sanitary and shipping canal um, that's less of a concern because those were two uh, historically disconnected systems so before uh, human intervention uh, the, the mississippi river system and the laurentian great lakes uh, were independent watersheds so having a electric barrier that stops fish movement between those two isn't actually changing any historical fish migrations or uh, dispersal of that nature because there was no historical connection. Um, and then as we think about site deployments, uh, we have to optimize uh, exactly that. Uh, if it's an important position, obviously, uh, uh, there's gonna be more interest in making sure that we have a robust uh, Asian cup deterrence that's gonna stop them in their tracks. Uh, if we want to start thinking about maybe um, deploying uh, seasonal deterrence in small tributaries to reduce the uh, uh, spawning and propagule pressure, um, then you can employ, uh, you know, using seasonal deterrence or single sensory modality deterrence that are species specific. So we saw in those figures of the acoustic deterrent that I saw, um, it, it produced an avoidance response in some fishes and not in others. So if you would employ just one acoustic deterrence uh, seasonally in a tributary, that's going to have a much smaller impact on general native fish movements. Um, but if you were uh, interested in stopping, you know, let's say the Asian cup disposal into the Great Lakes, like at the Chicago area shipping canal, or just full stop, we don't need it, you're going to want to use a much more robust, uh, more fully integrated deterrent system than just a one sensory uh, seasonal deterrent. Okay, um, so just in the interest of time, I think that we will wrap up here. I know we didn't get to all the questions, but 
like I said, they're all recorded within the system. So I will um, do my best to follow up with everybody whose question we couldn't answer and get to the answer you were looking for. So I just want to thank our speakers again, uh, Jen, Dr. Mandrak, Paul, and Eric. Thank you guys so much for presenting today. Those were awesome presentations and really great updates. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. We really appreciate it. And just one more reminder to please take a minute to fill out the survey if you have a chance. We would love to hear your feedback. It'll really help us when we're planning uh, future sessions like this. So up on the screen, you'll see my contact info. If you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, thank you, everyone, and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.